Well, hello there. You're back again. Uh, now that you are uh, motivated uh, by our last uh, little lesson on obesity, uh, what we're going to talk about today is looking at uh, things that would affect uh, hunger and appetite. We're going to look at uh, energy intake, energy output. Uh, we're going to talk about neurotransmitters and hormones and all kinds of good stuff. Um, but uh, so we're going to let you know what it takes us. You know, last time we talked about uh, how um, energy imbalance is going to determine whether you gain weight or lose weight. But energy balance, um, you know, is is kind of weighing the energy input and energy intake and energy output and making sure they're in, in balance. And since I don't want you to cry, I'm going to give you some ideas about what can affect how much we eat, what can determine that, and what regulators we have internally and externally that are going to determine that. Uh, but before we do that, you know, if you've ever had any genetics or if you've taken my 112 class, we've talked a little bit about the possibility, you know, down the road that um, you may not need males to procreate. Uh, they're, uh, you know, they're looking, they're finding basically uh, that they can turn uh, uh, mouse cells into eggs and they can actually clone, they can do stuff and stimulate, you know, reproduction. Uh, without a male. But I want to caution you that you should not, you know, get the idea that males could be eliminated. Because as you ladies know, there are times when you need a male. You need a male to fix things uh, around the house or, you know, th some things just go wrong and you need a man around to fix those things because we are amazing fixers we can find fixes for everything so let me just go show you why uh, you know you wouldn't want to get rid of males because without us uh, you would have a hard time fixing things so that they actually work so let's look at how men are important for fixing things see look at this guy uh, there's just because you're missing a tire uh, doesn't mean you can't uh, use your car. There are other ways that you can do that. Um, duct tape. I mean, men and duct tape just kind of go along with each other. Um, I mean, who needs a new refrigerator door for heaven's sake when you have duct tape? Uh, fixable. Fixable. Fixable mailbox so what if you don't have a mailbox there is a fix for that a little duct tape a little jar no problem you can still get your mail uh, you can either even duct tape the post so it stands up uh, so you know great idea creative we are very creative uh, look at uh, handles for the shower what the heck uh, we don't do well with cleaning okay I mean as you can tell but the shower will work uh, whether it's clean or not you know who cares big deal old discs that you don't use there is a way to use those uh, gas cap who needs a gas cap you got a disc a CD that you can use for heaven's sake um, <laughs> sinks just an old stool some boards heck you got that sucker you can stand up you know, you just needed to wash your hands, brush your teeth. Uh, you know, what, what does it matter what it looks like? Um, sprinklers? What an innovative idea. Uh, get an old pop soda liter uh, container and make a sprinkler out of it. Um, don't need to go and buy one. Uh, what the heck? And yeah, this is a dandy. Uh, who needs the little nut to put on the battery? We got to, you know, a C clamp there that works just fine. And shoot, front wheel, heck, look at that. Multi purpose. You can carry groceries. Who needs a front tire? What innovative. Uh, you ladies wouldn't have thought of this stuff. Uh, let's, let's face it. Come on. And then barbecues. <laughs> You got plenty of people coming over. You got ways to fix it. There is a way to fix it. And you can do multiple hot dogs 
Okay, uh, I don't know how that goes along with with energy balance, but hey, hot dogs, um, you know, for barbecues, yeah, we can overlook, you know, some of the calories. There, there is room for a hot dog at a barbecue. So anyway, ladies, don't get the idea you can get rid of us because we need you need us to fix these things. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about energy balance. Um, there's a difference between hunger and appetite. Uh, hunger is painful, okay? When, you're, when your stomach feels pain uh, and it's a drive for you, you know, to seek food kind of a thing, uh, and your stomach growls and, you know, things are happening inside that we'll talk about that cause you to be hungry and it's a, it's a, a negative feedback system that, you know, throughout mankind's, you know, um, age that um, has driven, you know, people to go search for food uh, kind of a thing. Uh, whereas appetite is a psychological thing that makes individuals eat when they're really not hungry. They just eat for whatever reason. So what we're going to go through next is to look at things that are involved in the uh, physiological drive for hunger and the uh, uh, psychological influence for appetite. So let's look at some internal forces. And we're looking at energy input and internal forces that deal with hunger. Um, and your body responds to blood nutrients. The, the liver has receptors that detect uh, nutrients in the blood. Uh, and we've talked, uh, we will talk about chylomicrons. I guess we've talked a little bit about them in digestion, but not too much. But we'll talk a little bit more about them, uh, I think, in the next lesson. But um, maybe not. But before we, talk about, before we talk about cardiovascular disease, we will talk about chylomicrons. But uh, it, uh, as you probably have heard, it takes about 20 minutes before, you know, after you start eating before you actually feel full. Uh, so that's one of the behavior modifications that uh, they recommend is that people, you know, eat slowly uh, and maybe put your, put your eating utensil down between bites and chew a lot so that, you um, it will, um, you know, by the time you know, the 20 minutes are up, you haven't snarfed it down. Uh, some of us eat fast, though. Uh, you know, I before I became a dietitian, before I, you know, started teaching and stuff, I actually worked for a living. And it was one of those places where I worked in quality control, but still you only had a half an hour for lunch. Uh, and, you know, it took you five minutes to get where the lunchroom is and five minutes to get back. So basically, it leaves you 20 minutes to eat and you kind of want to relax. So you just snarf things down. And I have a habit of snarfing things down really fast. Uh, I'm always finished before everybody else unless I think about it. I have to think about it. I said, slow down, slow down, slow down, because I just I just snarf it up. The problem is when you do that and you, you know, you're snarfing things down and you you get done with your whole plate in 10 minutes, your body hasn't responded to say you're full yet and you're more likely to get seconds um, and go from there. So uh, the amount of blood nutrients that you have, uh, you know, your body will respond to that and basically send signals that say, okay, uh, you know, the feedback system say, okay, you're, you're eating, you don't have to eat so much, you're feeling full. Um, Hormone regulation, uh, things that are hunger initiators are endorphins and ghrelin, uh, things that are terminators, so like cholecystokinin, um, and we talked about GIP when we were talking about uh, regulators, and leptin is kind of a biggie. Leptin has been studied a lot. You may have heard a lot about it. Uh, or at least heard the word possibility, but leptin is a feedback uh, system that basically comes from the fat cells and says signals through the bloodstream that basically uh, shut off hunger are supposed to be a negative feedback system to shut off hunger. Um, sometimes it works and sometimes it, it doesn't. Oops, sorry. Um, and here's just kind of a little graphic that kind of show you can see down at the bottom there where um, trying to get my little Thing, but down here where you can see leptin and all of that, and you can see uh, even we talked a little bit about insulin, how it's a feedback to uh, kind of a negative system for hunger. 
Uh, and then here's ghrelin that's going to be basically um, stimulate some other hormones that are going to deal with um, negative feedback that's going to uh, reduce uh, the amount of food intake. So we do have some neurotransmitters that do that. Uh, here's leptin. Uh, this just uh, a lot of studies been done on the OBOB -OB mice. The OBOB uh, -OB basically stands for their genetics. And some of you that have had genetics, OBOB -OB means it's homozygous. It's got two genes for obesity, OBOB. -OB. Um, so it's homozygous for obesity. And one of the things they found is because it doesn't produce leptin. And one of the studies they did, you can see the mouse on the right hand side is skinny. Uh, and basically, it it doesn't have the OBOB -OB gene. And they did a study that may sound kind of cruel, but I don't know. Uh, what they actually did is they they sewed these. Well, not these two, but maybe they they sewed a mouse that produced leptin with a mouse that was OBOB -OB together, and basically intertwined their circulatory systems. And the OBOB -OB mice mouse actually got thinner and thinner because it was producing leptin um, and <clears throat> so anyway there's some a possibility you know they're looking at very closely uh, with are there humans that don't produce leptin and they have found some but and, and it's hasn't been totally successful as you can imagine pharmaceutical companies are jumped on board because if you can find uh, if leptin would have worked um, you know, effectively, then, you know, that would have possibly been a, a salvation for our obesity problem that we have. Um, but it only worked in about 10, I think it was 15 to 20 percent of, of patients that didn't produce leptin. The addition of a leptin kind of supplement uh, just only works with 10 to or 15 to 20 percent of them. Uh, there is some evidence though this was a, a kid actually in England that uh, was under leptin therapy and it actually worked for him uh, so you can see that um, uh, you know it does does work but it doesn't work for a lot of people so it's not uh, of any benefit yet so obviously there's more than leptin that's involved it's a combination of things that are involved in in uh, weight control and that kind of thing but leptin is kind of a biggie they're still working on it but maybe in connection with uh, some other things that it will work um, as far as neurotransmitters and hormones other ones neuropeptide Y galanin are uh, initiators so neuropeptide Y seems to be uh, associated with uh, carbohydrates um, so there is a uh, you know, if you produce neuropeptide Y, that means basically you, there is some evidence that you get hungry for carbohydrates um, and uh, galanin for fats, that kind of thing. And, and so there's a possibility uh, that in some individuals could crave sweets. Um, now, that doesn't mean it's you. Uh, but there are, is a possibility because they have done some studies on mice and they've uh, basically taken away and, and well they've actually injected the mice with neuropeptide Y and they tend to um, skew towards um, the carbohydrate foods as opposed to the protein based foods and that kind of thing. Then galanin is uh, associated with fat. And so again, they've injected uh, with uh, gallon in, and uh, the mice tend to go towards more fatty things. Now, how that relates to humans is not really indicated yet, but there's some evidence there. So both neuropeptide Y and gallon in are produced as hunger initiators. Um, and then terminators, serotonin. You can you probably heard of serotonin after you know there's a lot of um, uh, you get a lot of serotonin production after you eat turkey on Thanksgiving, uh, and so uh, that's why you feel sleepy and that kind of thing. So actually, it, you know, it's a hunger terminator. It makes you, makes you feel more satiated, um, that kind of thing. And um, so there's some evidence for. It. And then POMC is another one that is. Uh, a terminator. So these neurotransmitters are going to be produced or not produced 
uh, based on some other signals, some feedback signals as to, you know, it could be blood nutrients, it could be other things that are going to trigger uh, production of neuropeptide Y or galanin. And then there are people who produce more neuropeptide Y or galanin than, than other people. So, you know, well, there isn't really anything that I know of that you can do yet as far as uh, kind of a negative feedback system for neuropeptide Y or anything like that. But uh, obviously they're working on it, as you might imagine. But anyway. Um, also, internal uh, signals, uh, your stomach getting bigger, that's one of the reasons that uh, one of the weight loss uh, ideas is to drink a lot of water before you eat and because it, dis it, it makes your, your stomach get bigger and then the distension is going to have a feedback that, hey, you're getting food and you, you don't have to eat so much kind of a thing. Obviously, you'd be, you feel hunger, hungry sooner because the water is going to go through pretty quickly. But um, initially, it can help to not overeat at one sitting. Uh, so it might be a, a possibility there. Um, so those are internal forces that are supposed to regulate when you are hungry and when you are not. But as you know, there are times when um, you eat when you're not really hungry, uh, and that is going to be your appetite, not hunger. Uh, and so external forces can override internal forces. So even though you're not hungry, you may overeat just because it's your appetite or just, you know, things. It could be environmental things. It could be other things. And we'll, we're going to discuss some of those. And uh, they may call those triggers, triggers that make you eat uh, even though you're not hungry, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, being overweight may not be a, a regulator problem, may not be a hormone problem, may not be a neurotransmitter problem. It may be psychological or something else that is driving you to actually eat more than you should. Um, kind of a thing. So let's look at some of those external forces that can override the internal forces. And so psychological factors, as, as you some of you may know, uh, your emotions can do two things. It depends on the person. Uh, emotions and stress, those kinds of things. Um, there are, you know, individuals who uh, are when they are are stressed out or they're depressed or you know have some emotional issues basically um, they will maybe overeat they will just think well I'm going to eat I'm going to eat a bunch of ice cream or or something like that uh, and this there, there is some evidence that this traces back to sub, some subconscious signals uh, that have developed over your lifetime um, uh, one one possibility is that a trigger may uh, may be switched back to your you know the subconscious back to the youth when you felt like you were the center of attention uh, or you were being celebrated. Uh, so it just depends. For example, uh, on a birthday, if it was your birthday. You know, everybody came to your birthday, you got presents, and but you also got cake, and you got ice cream, and you got punch, or something like that, or you got pizza, or, or something that may you may not get every single day, and it was especially just for you. It's just because it was your day that you got these um, this food, okay? So subconsciously... Uh, that that trigger is when when you feel like you're being celebrated, when you're the center of attention, when uh, you know it was an exciting time and it was a happy time, kind of a thing. So if you get depressed or stressed or something like that, um, the idea is you may revert back to something that reminds you of those times or makes you feel good, like you're celebrated or you're. Uh, you know, kind of get over your depression kind of thing. And it could be ice cream. So it could be things that are served uh, when you were celebrated, which is uh, one of the things they recommend for parents is that when you're 
um, when your kid has a birthday or if they, they get a special award, you know, at school or something like that, um, it's okay every once in a while to go out for pizza or to have ice cream. But if you do it every, every time, it, it can set a, a psychological, you know, in your subconscious psychological factor that may be reverted back to when you're an adult and will make you overeat. Cause you know, when you eat, when you're depressed and stuff, you're not hungry, it's your appetite kind of a thing. So, um, the recommendation is maybe to celebrate, maybe try to take them out on a weekend for a hike, you know, take them outdoors and do a hike and go walking or, do some activity, you know, whether maybe miniature golf or something to celebrate and say, we're going to go out as a family and we're going to just because of you kind of thing, instead of giving them ice cream and cake. I know that's a little harder because you have to actually do something, um, but it's better psychologically because when they're, when they get it to be an adult, the possibility could be that if they get depressed, they'll go take a walk and they'll get outdoors, they'll get out when times when the family was together, when they were doing things together and it made them feel like they were a happy time and it was just because of them that the family all got together and blah blah blah. So uh, it you know that may be something you might want to think about if you have young kids is don't always celebrate things and successes and when they're the center of attention with food you may want to try something else um, that will make them and you know another thing may not be to go out taking them shopping because in down the road when they become an adult when they get depressed they may go spend all their money just because you used to take them shopping so it's kind of a fine line but you maybe come up with some ideas that will help them in their actually in their future um but you know when i get depressed or i get i i don't eat i i just I don't want to, I don't want people to be around me. I just say, stay away from me. I'll be fine, but just let me get over this. And I go outside, I work in the garden or I go do something, uh, because I remember working outside in the garden with my dad, I guess, or, uh, when I was out with my brother and we'd go out and work in the field or just something like that. And I mean, we had a good time. Um, it was hard work, but you know, the benefits were that, you know, you, it was just fun being outside and that kind of thing. So I tend to do that. So I don't overeat when I'm depressed. Uh, I tend to go outside and do stuff. Um, so you might want to think about that. And also, also uh, binge eating disorders, you know, those are psychological. When you binge eat, your, it's not really because you're hungry. It's an appetite issue that you just eat food. Uh, so what is stress spelled backwards? Desserts. Yeah. Anyway, um, physical factors, uh, it's amazing how, um, how things are presented that sometimes will make us actually choose uh, things that um, have more calories than we actually uh, think they do. Um, I just came across this article um, the other day looking at container size. I've talked a little bit about it when I, if you've taken my 112 class, we talked about uh, how when you go to a um, fast food place, it's pretty normal if they, if they offer you small, medium, or large, most people will choose medium. That's just the way we are. Um, but it just depends on, you know, if it's a visual thing, uh, what is considered medium. Um, we tend to think that, and I'll show you some pictures here in a bit, but we tend to think that <clears throat> tall, skinny things have more than short, wide things because there's a three-dimensional thing. I'll try to show you a video here, but I, whether it works or not, I'm not sure, uh, but we'll see, hopefully. But tall, skinny things seem to uh, indicate something that's bigger, even though the volume of a short wide thing is is the same as a tall skinny thing um we tend to think of the tall skinny thing as having some has a more uh so two ways that can go if you want to get more you you choose the tall skinny thing if you want to think you're getting less you choose the short wide thing so this is used by advertisers to 
give the impression of something either more or less. Large bowls versus small bowls. Uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, if you give somebody a large bowl, they will tend to fill it up no matter what. If you give them a smaller bowl, they'll fill that one up. So depending on the size of the bowl will determine serving size for some people. They will just fill it up. Uh, and because a large bowl, it doesn't look like you're getting as much. Uh, and when you have a smaller bowl, you tend to fill it up and you think you're getting a lot more. Even though you may have the same amount in both bowls, it doesn't look like there's as much in a larger bowl. So again, what size of a container you're actually eating your food in could make a difference. Um, and then we talked about small, medium, and large. Uh, labels, we'll talk, I'll, I'll go into more about container size here in a minute, but labels, uh, people tend to think of organic things as being less caloric than non-organic things. So if you see a, uh, a uh, food that says it's organic, it tends to make people think that there's less calories in it. And that has nothing to do whether it's organic or not. Low fat, people think less calories. Doesn't matter. Uh, pack, the pictures on the packages, the colors and everything. Uh, they've done some studies with college students where they took some Ritz crackers and they changed the box where the box on the front of the box they had say like 20 crackers as part of the display. On the other box they had like five crackers on the display. And so when um, they, these college students took the boxes they and the study they did uh, students actually ate more from the box that had 20 crackers on the front as opposed to one that had five crackers uh, because they they related that to servings uh, as part of the picture so a picture can can um, determine how much you eat it's pretty amazing how much visual has in our eating and then fancy language like if uh, if you have ice cream that says vanilla versus decadent French vanilla, uh, you basically tend to think that the fancy name uh, kind of tends to make you think more calories, uh, kind of a thing. And so you choose, even though they're the same calories, uh, but it, it it makes it sound richer, even though it may be the same ice cream, if, you know, vanilla versus, you know, decadent French vanilla. Um, it, it may influence, you know, what you buy and if you think it's high calorie, low calorie, that kind of thing. But uh, anyway, so uh, those are physical things that can determine appetite. Let's look at some pictures here. Uh, which which has the most popcorn? Um, if you look at the, you know, if, if you didn't know, you know, now that we've talked about it, you know, but if you didn't know, basically the, the tall one, most people would choose the tall one as having more as opposed to the bottom one. If you look at the extra large one, um, and, and so if they wanted to get less popcorn, they'd usually choose the uh, bottom one that's more short and wide and the tall one if they wanted more. If they think you're getting more for your money, then you would choose the tall one. And that's just to how, how they do in grocery stores. Uh, they will use tall if, if they want to make the customer think they're getting more. And short, you know, if it's a diet thing, they may make it short and stubby because it makes it look like you're getting less. Uh, let's see if this video will show and then we'll go from there. Hopefully it will. Let me go down here, please. And it should be right here. And we'll see if it shows. Tell the world who you are. Hi, I'm Lalia Ulabayeva. I'm an assistant professor of marketing here at Erasmus University. And in front of you are three candles. And uh, I, want I want to know, know which, which one's one bigger, bigger, the one on the, the left, left or the or one, one on the right. right? So you're right. When you look at these two large candles, people get a little confused about which one is bigger. So what we find is that when people compare large candles to a smaller reference, like the one in the middle, they think that candles that increase along just a single dimension, such as height that we see right here, 
uh, is much bigger compared to a product, a candle in this case, that increases along all three dimensions, height, width, and length. So when judging between, you know, the size of the two candles here on the left and on the right, people think that this one is larger than this one. And this basically happens because people are pretty bad in math, so it's difficult to uh, multiply things and to come up with volume estimates. So people use very simple rules such as looking at height or uh, adding different dimensions and stuff in order to come up with their estimates of volume. And those basically lead them to make these errors. So if we think in terms of a product decrease, it works in the same way. So if we look now at these two smaller candles and the one that's in the middle, people, people again, again think that the change from this big candle to the smaller one is much greater when the change occurs along a single dimension, which is height, compared to a change that occurs along all three dimensions. So the left and the right one are actually the same volume. They're actually the same volume, as are these two large candles. So yeah. it's a little visual trick. <laughs> I see. And so what is the, what is the policy implications of, of this finding? So it's important for people to understand how much they're actually consuming out of different packages. And provided these different product supersizing trends that have happened over the past several decades, it has become harder and harder for people to understand how much they're actually eating. What we find is that providing people with product supersizing or product downsizing that occurs along just one dimension is going to lead them to make much more informed decisions compared to product supersizing or downsizing that occurs along all three dimensions. So think in terms of, let's say, a Pringles box or any um, bag of chips that you have. Uh, it's much better for you to use a bag that increases along the single dimension, such as a pack of Pringles, which only increases in height, compared to a bag that increases along all three dimensions, such as um, just a, you know, a soft bag of chips that increases along all three dimensions. I see. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So that just gives you an indication of um, uh, how that kind of works. So be careful when you're shopping uh, and uh, know that uh, advertisers are pretty smart people. This is another, uh, you know, where you choose the small, medium, and large. If you look at the left here, um, the poss you know, if you looked at this and, and had a choice uh, and you looked at, you know, all of these, most people would actually choose this one here because that's the medium one and people choose medium uh, but if we just if the display only shows three cups uh, then the middle one which is basically this large one here um, it becomes the medium sized one and and people would choose it more uh, because this one just looks too small this one these you know this just looks too big but this one looks just right compared to these two. But if, if you look at here, most people would choose this one uh, because it's in the midi, it's in the middle. That's just how we are. So basically, um, if a uh, marketer wanted to sell more of the larger Starbucks, they would basically take away these two as a display um, and that would force people to choose this one more than this one. So, again, marketers, marketer, marketers are very smart uh, in doing that. So, anyway, but again, visual things can make you choose things that are uh, higher in calorie just because you know of, of their dimensions, as she was talking about. So, it's kind of interesting stuff. A lot of psychology into uh, calories. Other environmental factors is basically uh, how much food is available. If there's plenty of variety, if you go to a smorgasbord, you're going to eat more than if you go to a barbecue that basically has hamburgers, corn on the cob, and potato salad, and that's it. Uh, you're just going to eat more. That's just because you have to try everything. Um, they've done a lot of studies where they, you know, have a whole table and people just keep coming back to try things and doing you know just to try the different foods and they nip all and say oh I can just have a little bit of this and a little bit of that blah 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 and uh, so the more food available the more you will eat the time of the day 
Um, sometimes habits gets in the way that that even though you're not hungry, you will eat. A uh, classic example that uh, in my life basically is that you know I, I'm one of those people that I want to get a project done before I eat which drove my wife crazy when we first got married because she grew up in a family where you ate breakfast at seven you ate lunch at noon and your dinner was at six and that's the way it was uh, and you know it was the old-fashioned way where basically um, you know the meals were prepared you know and ready and you either were there to eat or you weren't and so the time of day became the the issue and so that's what she grew up with um, and uh, you know it used to drive me crazy sometimes when her dad would um, you know we'd be working out in the field and you know we'd be maybe three quarters of the way done you know he'd work on a tractor or whatever three quarters of the way done and he would look at his watch and be 12 o'clock and say well it's time for lunch and he'd stop and go and get it and we had you know a quarter left to go and I would be thinking why don't we just finish this thing get done go have lunch and we want to come back but no we, it was noon it was time to eat so we'd go we'd eat and then we'd have to go out into the hot and start over again I, you know I didn't feel like working after I'd eat, eaten you know at lunch or something so you know, when we first got married, I'd be out working in the yard or doing something, and my wife said, hey, lunch is ready, because it was noon. I mean, that's what she was used to. Uh, it was noon, and and I'd say, okay, I'll, I'll be there when I get done. And so I would be, and it could be another hour. And so she'd come, your, your lunch is getting cold, you know, and I'd say, oh, I want to finish this. I just want to get it done. I don't have to come back and do it. Uh, and so... Well, basically, she learned uh, that, you know, if it was lunchtime, she basically now says, well, you know, when you're done, just come in and fix your own and you just have it whenever you want to. So, you know, that's how that worked. Uh, anyway, but um, but for some people, noon is lunch, 6 o'clock is dinner, 7 o'clock is breakfast. It doesn't matter if you're hungry or not. That's when you eat. It's, it's it. Uh, ever wonder why uh, supermarkets are cold? And restaurants, when you order by menu, are cold. Uh, do you ever feel that way? Cold increases hunger, uh, and warm decreases hunger. When you're out on a hot day, a lot of times you don't feel like eating. You feel like having lemonade or something and drinking something, but you don't really feel like eating. If you're out sweating on a hot day, you just it just don't feel like eating. Um, but cold will increase your hunger so that's why they reduce the temperature I you know I've never done it because I don't go to smorgasbords because I'm one of those people if you go to smorgasbord uh, I want my money's worth and so I will eat a lot and and uh, even though I'm not hungry I will get that dessert at the end I don't care uh, and so if I pay 10 12 bucks or whatever I'm gonna get my 10 12 bucks worth because I know my wife won't so I'm gonna eat her portion too because I don't want to waste my money uh, and um, I'd be very surprised. I've never thought about it as I was in there because it's been a long time since I've been a smorgasbord. We used to go because my dad liked to go to them. But I would be surprised if the temperature was not warmer in a smorgasbord as opposed to a place where you order by menu. Um, yeah, I would think it would be because they don't want people to eat as much. So I'm guessing, so if some of you go to smorgasbords, take a thermometer and take the temperature and report back to me uh, and then go to a place where you order by menu or where, where they want you to order more and see if it's colder. Okay, Clean Plate Club, I'm part of that. Uh, Clean Plate Club is basically the club where you never leave anything on your plate because the people in wherever are starving and, you know, you, you should be fortunate you have food so you should finish your plate or no you can't have dessert until you clean your plate okay that's the clean plate club because I feel guilty if I don't clean my plate so I have to be very careful with my portion sizes because whatever I give myself I will finish it I cannot push the plate away I just feel guilty that's just the way I was grown you know I was, I was grown up that's the way I was raised. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, um, so I'm part of the Clean Plate Club, and some of you, are, and so that can make you overeat if you overserve yourself, uh, which is one of the reasons. You know what they they recommend doing is that 
Um, for kids, you know, if if the idea is they have to clean their plate before they get dessert, then reduce their serving sizes. Uh, get their serving sizes down to where it's manageable and you don't have to tell them, no, you have to clean your plate kind of a thing. Um, so anyway, um, that would be the option there. So it's not the minutes at the table to put on weight, it's the seconds. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, these should be pretty obvious. Energy dense foods, high fat foods, high sugar foods. You know, if you choose those as opposed to less energy dense foods, you know, um, and we tend to, again, because of our appetite, we just crave sugar or something like that. Um, intake versus output, uh, you know, medications you take can affect your hunger and, and make you eat when you don't want to. So there's several things there. Let's look at energy output. So those are all dealing with energy input. Energy output, your basal metabolite rate basically is if you're lying on a table, awake, you're breathing, your heart's beating, all that kind of stuff, the amount of energy necessary to keep you alive is is basically your basal metabolism rate and it's going to be the most uh, you know it's going to be the the one that uses the most calories uh, or have the most energy output of anything um, so but the BMR can be affected by different things uh, the basal metabolism rate as you get older you know say you're mature at 20 uh, for each decade, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, you're going to lose 2% uh, of your BMR uh, just because of, you know, activities uh, that your body does. You just kind of slow down. So that probably will you know, show you as you get older why it's harder and harder to lose weight because, you, you know, just sitting around, you're not using as much calories, many calories. Um, because of the extra fat layer, now again, it's not my fault, but ladies, you uh, have extra insulate, we'll call it insulation, uh, because you have the extra fat layer, and you actually have, uh, your BMR is 10% less than a male, so again, another indicator why uh, in a lot of cases it's easier for men to lose weight than it is for women, because, I mean, the idea is you're not, lose, you're not able to lose as much heat. Uh, because of that uh, fat layer, the insulation, and so men tend to lose a lot of heat, so we have to keep our bodies at 98.6. We actually burn more calories uh, you know, during a day. Uh, lean body mass, um, the higher levels of lean body mass you have, uh, basically, you know, if you've had some cell biology, you know that if you increase your lean body mass, you're going to increase mitochondria, and mitochondria use energy to keep themselves going, and so you'll actually um, use more energy uh, while you're sleeping if you have more lean body mass, which is another reason why you should exercise. Obesity, again, if you increase the amount of insulation, the amount of fat layer, you're not going to lose as much heat, and so your BMR is going to go down. Um, in the adaptive thermogenesis, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but this has to do with how much heat production is is produced, and it's, it deals with what we call brown fat. So we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that in a second. And then there can be some thyroid issues. That if you have a low thyroid, you will decrease your BMR. High thyroid will increase, and it has to do with thyroxin that deals with uh, basal metabolism. So there are some things that affect your, your BMR. Uh, but you know some some significantly and some not uh, let's talk a little bit about brown fat there are two types of fat there's yellow fat uh, which is the normal stuff that you'd see you know in your hips or your stomach and then there's a brown uh, adipose tissue and there's a difference because um, white fat is for storage for future energy needs brown fat is um, has a mechanism where it produces a lot of heat. For example, um, seals and polar bears that live in real cold areas have a lot more brown fat than uh, than uh, other animals because they have to produce a lot of heat to live in those cold areas. And they tend to burn a lot of calories by producing heat, which means this is why they have to eat a lot uh, to maintain that caloric intake. 
because they're just burning a lot off of uh, as heat. Uh, and so here's you can see the difference and you can see on the right hand side all the brown fat how many mitochondria that it has versus the white blood cell um, and so you can see it's just it's used to burn a lot of energy but it's insufficient energy as we'll we'll talk about um, babies tend to have a lot of brown fat uh, around their back you can see where the dark brown area is because it increases heat production to keep them warm in those areas. I'm not really quite sure why it's just in those areas, but it, it tends to be there, and so it helps keep them warm and from being chilled when they're first born. Um, some of you remember this reluctantly from, from your biology class, but um, this is a respiration where we're making ATP. The thing I want to key in on is, um, if I can find my arrow, oh, here it is. Um, is down here where if you remember we have um, the electron transport chain that is transporting uh, electrons going through here and causing the hydrogen or the protons to be transported into the intramembrane of space and then in order to uh, or creating concentration gradient in order to go back they have to go through the ATP synthase to produce ATP um, and on a regular basis, what we talked about in cell biology is our, you know, if we took glucose and went through the whole process, only it's only about 40% efficient. So we lose 60% as heat. But in brown fat, you lose more than that. So if you look at this scenario, here's the idea. We transport these, these protons or hydrogen ions out here in the space. And then in normal cases, they would go back through ATP synthase to make ATP. But there's another factor here in brown fat <clears throat> where hydrogen ions can actually sneak through here and produce heat so that all of the protons that are here don't become ATP and so you become even more inefficient but you produce more heat because the body's going to go through have to go through or the cells are going to have to go through more of these processes to create enough ATP that is necessary uh, and, and so your efficiency goes down because a lot of these pro, or, yeah, protons are going to go through without producing ATP and they're going to produce more heat. Um, so that's the way they're built and so they burn a lot of calories basically because they have to uh, utilize more glucoses to try to make more, or more lipids and stuff to make more ATPs because of the inefficiency. That's basically brown fat. There is some indication that there are some humans that would, may have more brown fat than other humans. These would be the individuals who are always warm. They always have to have the windows open. It doesn't matter if it's winter or not. They're always warm. They have to sleep with the windows open. Um, they wear short sleeves shirts even though it's cold outside. They're skinny. Uh, they eat a lot. They just keep seem like they just burn their calories off. Um, these would be individuals that potentially could have a lot more brown fat than than other individuals. Uh, so these can affect you know the BMR uh, if you do have that. Um, other things, thermic effect of exercise or TEEs, how much activity you do. This would be you can you can change your BMR a little bit by becoming having more lean body mass, but exercise is going to be where you're going to make the most significant difference in energy output. Um, th it's the one you can regulate the most. You can't really regulate too much BMR because I mean, you can't change the sex that you are. You can't deal with your age as much. Uh, I mean, you just just happens. Uh, brown fat, there is some study to figure out how we can make more brown fat possibly there could be possibly down the road convert more of our energy into brown fat um, so exercise is going to be the key for energy output and then thermic effect of food is about 10 percent of calories is burned just digesting your food um, so it's not a significant amount but so your total energy output is these three things added together is going to be your total energy output. There are some, if you look on uh, online, you can find some uh, some uh, 
uh, formulas basically that are rough drafts of, of how you could determine what your energy output is. Uh, there's uh, ways to determine your percentage BMR and your you should know based on what your activity level what your percentage exercise is and then 10 percent for food and you can do a rough estimate of how much your energy output is there's lots of, of ways to do that um, but anyway um, we were just talking about how energy uh, you know TEE t uh, exercise is the main determining factor you can't really change your how much you burn with uh, with digestion even though proteins take more energy than carbohydrates that kind of thing but um, not significantly and then B BMR you really can't you can increase your lean body mass and decrease fat you know decrease some of the uh, the uh, insulation but not significantly so exercise is going to be the key so we need to adjust uh, our exercise level and you can see where the exercise it, it's pretty interesting that the lowest exercise levels if you remember from obesity these were the same areas that had the highest caloric intake the highest obesity rates were down in there uh, we tend to do pretty good in Oregon but we still are are in the upper scale of obesity um, but it's it's a direct correlation with energy intake and exercise, you know, in these areas. Um, so, you know, again, they don't use the word exercise much because it makes people feel like they're sweating. But, um, you know, movement, activity, whatever you want to call it, you, we need to do it. It's, it's critical. Um, now to lose weight, I mean there are some there is some evidence that uh, to lose weight exercise is not uh, as beneficial as reducing your food intake. So food intake is the key to losing weight, but maintaining the weight loss is where exercise comes in. Uh, like we kind of mentioned before, it's the easiest part of losing weight is losing the weight. The hardest part is staying there for the rest of your life if you don't exercise it's very extremely difficult to do that so exercise is going to help you maintain your weight loss it's not going to hurt while you're losing weight um, because it's going to increase lean body mass and that kind of stuff but the, the key is to decrease your food intake but to maintain you need that at least a hundred and fifty minutes per week of a moderate exercise and we talked a little bit about that before um, and then if you as you're losing weight if you want to help it, it's upwards into the 300 uh, minutes per week that you need to do in order to help lose weight but at least 150 minutes is anything less than that basically is good it's better than nothing but it's not going to help as much okay Eating abnormalities, just, just so you know, you probably heard the words, but you may not know where the, they're derived from, but um, here are the prefixes, an means without, ortho, stray, bull, bull means like an oxen or a bull, um, and then the suffix is hunger or eating, and then nervosa means you have an obsession with it, so bulimia nervosa basically is eating like a bull, and you have an obsession with eating like a bull. Um, and so it's episodes of binge eating again this goes beyond hunger and it's self-induced vomiting and so you know people stick their finger down their throat or sometimes that's you know after a period of time your body gets used to that and there have been individuals who roll up you know paper or roll up things to stick down their throat to make themselves uh, but these are you know these eating abnormalities are something a normal dietitian wouldn't touch this is a psychological issue it's not a nutrition issue obviously nutrition comes into play because of the lack of it but a registered dietitian wouldn't bring an individual and say well you need to start not doing this I mean it's a whole psychological thing that uh, a a psychologist or psychiatrist that is also in tune with nutrition needs to deal with um, so it's not something that you personally should try to talk somebody out of because it's it's totally a mindset that they need to 
deal with. And so this would be that. Um, and then the vomiting thing. Anorexia nervosa basically is an obsession with not eating uh, and that an obsession that you are fat. Even to the extent that, you know, most women have the little pooch, you know, in their abdomen that's just that's just who they are and that's what you, you deal with. But um, people with anorexia tend to think that that's fat and they're trying to get rid of it and it's not going to work. And so uh, you can get to the point where your heart stops functioning and stuff like that. So it's a distortion of what if you're fat or not kind of a thing. Uh, so this would be uh, anorexia. There is another one though called orthorexia nervosa which basically is um, a fixation with eating correctly uh, and so it's a manipulation of food based on the food itself so the food itself becomes your obsession uh, and it could go as far as um, all of your meat or something has to be exactly one inch square uh, or you throw it away so it, it's that or even even things like um, organic food can become an obsession if it's not organic you won't eat it doesn't matter what or uh, something that you know, something in the food it, it has to have that in the food you're not going to eat or you can't have that or you're not going to eat it um, and it things have to be cooked for exactly two minutes and if it's over two minutes it's not worth eating kind of so it's again it's it's totally psychological it's an obsession with eating everything correctly and perfectly uh, and so some people can get to that point where you know, say, well, I'm never going to have a, a hamburger again, and anything close to that, I'm not going to eat. And they just get obsessed with, oh, you know, kind of thing. There's room for everything in a diet. Okay, it's just again, you're looking at variety and moderation and that kind of thing. But there's even a book about it, overcoming the obsession with healthful eating. You know, there is such a thing as going overboard with healthy eating. Uh, people become so obsessed with it that they just go crazy and that's not healthy okay um, but anyway so the first step to combating obesity is raising awareness uh, the benefits of traditional foods um, this is one of the this came out of uh, a, a um, study or a, basically a, a person who lives in Jamaica because like we were talking about um, people around the world, obesity is increasing people around the world. I mean, Thailand is probably the less obese of any country in the world, but even obesity is increasing there. And the reason is because people are getting away from the traditional foods. They're not preparing foods at home. They're eating out. They're, a lot of countries are adopting the American diet. A lot of fast food places sprouting up and stuff. And, um, they're getting away from traditional foods that were healthy from the farm and um, you know the rule of thumb is to eat as close to the earth as you possibly can uh, and closest to the earth is a carrot comes from the earth that's about as close as you can get but uh, you know cattle and and animals are once removed from the earth because they eat what came from the earth so as close as you can eat to the earth the better uh, the more traditional that you can eat, you know, go to the farmers markets, go to, you know, get the vegetables and get those things um, and, and uh, you know, include those in your diet and get away from, I know it's hard to cook at home, but do your best. I mean, I'll limit the amount that you eat out and say, okay, we're going to eat, you know, if you eat out five times a week, say, well, we'll just eat out three times a week and the other two days will get pre-prepared. Whether you have to go to the grocery store and buy them pre-prepared, I mean, buy them finger fruits. They're the easiest. You know, whatever. It's it's still cheaper than going to fast food for what you get, you know, the benefits. <clears throat> and then even Benjamin Franklin way back then uh, had the right idea to lengthen thy life, lessen thy meals. Okay. So, um, Hopefully with the uh, lessons in obesity and this, it gives you a, a good rationale for taking care of your life and doing the best you can to eat well, but also exercise and get that done. We'll see you later.